Yeah. So first of all, I'm not an expert on on international law by any stretch of the imagination. No. Not even an amateur. But that hasn't stopped me from commenting before. That it won't stop me today either. Uh, so the issue with international law is that it's like who does the international law? Is it the United Nations or whoever? And then like, okay, well, if the United Nations does it, who's going to enforce it? Because it's not like the United States, the United Nations has an army. So if the United Nations or whoever makes international law says, all right, you're not allowed to do this, then someone uh, violates it. It's like, okay, well, what's actually, what, what's the consequences, right? The only actual consequences you can really have are like military consequences or like economic consequences. And they actually as far as I can tell, only come about from individual countries making a decision that they don't like what you've done, right? So when we go into like the Middle East and, you know, drone King Obama is doing all sorts of all sorts of operations and even, you know, Bush, Bush, you know, was the, was the original, the founder of the invasion. And, um, yes, he you know, was. Trump, Trump's got some people there as well. Yeah, he, uh, does. he does. People and, don't and, then, <laughs> and so then you say like, okay, well, my understanding is that there's a whole lot of breaches of international law going on there, but then we're saying to China, you can't control the water that's just outside your country, which you rely on for energy and food imports. And China says, well, if you've got like thousands of troops in the Middle East, uh, you know, doing regime change wars and just digging up other people's oil, uh, surely we're allowed to protect our own backyard, which we need to feed our own people. And so then you say, okay, well, international law says, you know, you have to follow these rules in the South China Sea. And then when China says, I don't care what international law says, it's like, all right, well, now we come to an impasse. What are you going to do? You're going to send in an army? You're going to put on trade restrictions? Um, or you're just going to say, all right, China's the person who's in charge of the South Pacific and US, you know, should back can back off or is US going to send a few aircraft carriers in uh, to try and intimidate and, and play games? And it's an interesting question. I don't know the answer, but fundamentally nobody cares as far as I can tell about international law. They care about their own national interest. You you defend China. I you? defend China. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely yeah, more defensive of China. Than I'm definitely more defensive of China than like I would say alternative media. You? If you end up um, marrying a Chinese woman, your bloodline is lost. <laughs> Sorry, lost that's so right. Who says I might get higher IQ kids? Who knows? Um, <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. Well, so I think China, um, you know, one of the criticisms going to be leveled against me for my whole, uh, you know, for the rest of my life, as long as I continue to say things, is going to be that I'm a Chinese agent because, you know, full disclosure, I did a significant, significant sum of money from the Chinese government in the form of a scholarship to study there. Um, <laughs> but basically, I just think, I think they get a lot of hate for, um, things they shouldn't get heat about. And there's a range of things which we should be really concerned about. And I just find that sometimes the media narrative is is focused on the wrong thing. Now, there's a range of areas where we should be very critical of China. For example, what they're doing in Xinjiang. Um, but things like criticism leveled at China about like One Belt, One Road taking over the world through debt trap diplomacy is not really quite true as far as I can tell from talking to experts. Um, the, the the people being angry at China over their role in the South China Sea is is yeah. wrong. Um, hopefully, it would be a ginger Tim. But I mean, I mean, one of the things we had uh, we had a funny discussion with with Tim uh, among other people when that Chinese spy story was coming out, and everyone's like, "This is a showing how the Chinese uh, are trying to take over Australia through the spies." Now we ran when we still did the weekly news show, the wrap on Carnage House, which we don't do anymore. We covered yeah. that story in as much detail as we could uh, outlining the allegations but then we also had a look at what the Chinese were saying we had a look at what the embassies were publishing what the Chinese media were posting and seeing what we could find what we found was that there was a whole lot of inconsistencies with the guy claiming to be the Chinese spy now lo and behold we were the only people as far as we tell in Australia to talk about it and then we found uh, at about a month later in like a page six retraction or whatever it was uh, that this guy was a low-level spy at best, probably, uh, you know, zero. And that's why the Australian um, intelligence agencies did not give him uh, the political asylum because he was basically just making it up. And But the reason why it became a front-page news story and ABC ran a headline saying this is the biggest intelligence story in Australia since something in the Soviet Union was because there is this general fear within within like Australians uh, about China kind of taking over. The, the Uyghur Muslims 
And that's the situation in Xinjiang I referenced earlier, which is one of the things that the, the media is not talking about very much, but should be a cause of major concern. What people are often talking about in the media is things like the China spy story and, and the amount of international Chinese students in Australian universities, which are things which are like one belt, one road criticism, which, which I think, as far as I can tell, are groundless. Confucius Institute is another one. People say it's a propaganda machine. I went through it. Uh, it was probably the least political of any of my subjects at school. I tried to write a uh, opinion article in response to one of the stories when I was in year 12 in a Confucius yeah. classroom. Uh, and it didn't get published, but that's a big part of the reason why I was able to learn Chinese. The first time I went to China to study was under a Confucius scholarship, and they just tell you about you do Chinese characters, they fund your Mandarin lessons, you go to different sites around it. So it's a really good program, actually, and Australian kids aren't going to be able to learn Chinese half as good without it. I mean, as much as it helps you out in, like, being able to speak two languages, there's a lot of benefits, but particularly being non-Chinese and being able to speak Chinese as an Australian, the benefits you get are often from... Chinese people appreciating you taking the time to, to learn their culture and learn their language. And mm. they really appreciate it because it's almost always the other way around. 